talk this afternoon is a combination of John Chaika's series on uh, translation surfaces. Okay, so the goal of today's talk is I want to talk about a particular construction of minimal not nuclear data flows on translation surfaces because number one, it's hard to build any of these objects. These are things that are going to be used in lecture three. And so there's a couple of reasons why we care about this construction. Number one, this, it's kind of amazing that any of these exist, at least from one standpoint of thinking about things. There exists any minimal and not uniquely flow, ergodic flows on translation surfaces. In fact, if you think about the torus, if there's a flow on the translation structure on the torus with the translation structure, then uh, the flow is either periodic or it's uniquely ergodic. Okay. Um, do you have a question? About yeah, just the flow. The flow. You fix a translation I surface. I fix a translation surface, and I'm flowing in a given direction on it. It's going to be the horizontal or the horizontal direction. And there exists certain special translation surfaces where that flow is minimal and not uniquely. It cannot be a torus. So this is flow on a translation surface, yes. and not flow on. We don't move between translation surfaces. We fix one and flow on it. Correct, but it's going to. Give, I'm going to be producing a family. Yeah. yeah thank you for bringing that up. It's going to be a family. Uh, okay, and so this is one reason. We'll get one example. Second is this construction is actually this construction we're using when we apply the tremor operator, which I'll talk about in lecture three, so it's very relevant to think about. Um, I have an, another reason I like, uh, which is that this construction is extremely useful. It's extremely useful because it's built from tori with one additional parameter, and so you can really understand a huge amount about it by hand. And it's been studied extensively by people who have used it to build interesting examples or to answer questions that are typically impossible to answer, but it can be concretely answered very beautifully in this setting. So um, I think this is a group, even if aside from everything else I'm talking about in my course, if you have interests in translation surfaces, this is a great gateway into translation surfaces. It's an explicit example that can be really understood in kind of special ways and you can answer all sorts of things about it. I really love this construction. In fact, it's a construction so nice that it was discovered at least twice. So if you notice by the name, I call it Katak, Stoipen, and Veach. Um, so Katak and Stoipen um, came up with this example of a translation surface which has a flow that's uh, minimal, not uniquely ergodic, and later Sakayev kind of did a uh, kind of generalization of this that showed that the, uh, that the optimal bound on the, the maximal number of ergodic measures for a minimal and not uniquely ergodic flow on a translation surface was actually attained. This is the, v, this is the genus as proposed by Kaha. Veach uh, studied, uh, came up with this on his own. Um, this was before he thought about internal exchange transformations. Uh, and he was interested in auto, almost automorphic sequences. And he had dreams of ways of building lots of almost automorphic sequences built from skew products over rotations. Uh, and he couldn't figure out how to do it. And essentially, this construction is an obstruction to, to, to this dream. So this is how he came up with this construction. OK. Um, all right. So the next thing I want to do is I want to hide this. So the first thing, uh, so let me ask people a question. Who knows who's, uh, did not mean to turn off the lights on everybody. Um, who's heard the term uniquely ergodic before? And so people know things about it, like it means the uniform convergence of Birkhoff averages for continuous functions. Who knows that? Pretty much, okay. That's just kind of context for this talk. So the, the moral of the story, if you're one in the complement of the people who raised the question for the second thing, is unique ergodicity is a very special property that's very nice and has a lot of consequences that are cool. Okay. All right, so I want to start off this talk. Um, so my goal is to mainly explain this construction and then uh, explain kind of the family of uh, two Tori glued along a slit, which will show up again in my next talk, lecture three. But I want to start in my building my example by being extremely abstract. We're going to forget everything, and we're just going to kind of wave our hands. And then we're going to see that in the special case of abstract uh, of rotations, you can follow the abstract framework and come up with a really concrete map that kind of looks nice. Then we're going to interpret it geometrically. That's the goal. 
So I'm going to be kind of stupid for a bit. It's just going to be completely trivial how everything is, but also just so general it seems useless. Okay, everyone okay with that? You'll follow me? Okay. All right, so let's imagine that we have a map T from, let's say, a compact metric space X to itself, and let's assume that it is minimal. and mu measure preserving. All right, um, so does everybody know what minimal means? Right? It means the orbit of every point is dense. It's a nice kind of object. So what I want to do is I want to build a new map, t hat, and I want to build it on x cross z mod 2z. And I want it to have two ergodic measures. that there's one way to do this. You could make t hat just be t, uh, and I want to build it from as a skew product of x, so I want it to still do what x t did on the first coordinate, and I want it to do something else on the second coordinate. Now, if it was the identity map, you would have one such example, but I want to do something just slightly more complicated than that. I want to take a measurable set a, Oh, and I want this to be bi-measure preserving, bi-measurable, bi-measure preserving. Because I don't want to write inverses all the time. I want to save myself the trouble of writing inverses. That's all the only reason why I'm doing this. Um, a be measurable, uh, and A comma T of A be disjoint. Okay, so now I can construct a map, T hat of x comma i, where i is thought of as an equivalence class. It's an element of z mod 2z, okay? And I want this to be, well, it's going to be t of x on the first coordinate, and then it's going to be i plus the characteristic function of a mean t of a on the second coordinate. Is everyone okay with this? So basically, I keep running around until I land in the set of a, and then I move to the other fiber, and then I move back in the next step. Everyone okay with this? So this is a very slight generalization of the very stupidest map I could do, which is I do t on the first coordinate, and I change it on the second coordinate. And it has two ergodic measures, but most of which that project to being a mu if I forget about the second coordinate. And those measures are supported on x minus t of a cross zero, union x minus t, I'm sorry, union t of a cross one. Is everyone okay with that? Is the characteristic function related to x or t x? It's evaluated x, it doesn't really matter which one you do. Can you ever describe again what exactly the, does the transformation? Yeah, so it does exactly what the formula says, which means you move according to t, on the base, doing nothing until you land at A, and then in the next step you move up to the other fiber, and then at T of A, then you move down for the next fiber after that. So if a point is in T of A, it switches fibers, and if a point is in A, it switches fibers. Okay? And if you did it the way you would say, it said with the T here, a lot of people like to write it with the T here, but you just apply inverses and you do it one step before. Same thing. Everyone okay with this? This is the support of one measure. And then there's the support of another ergodic measure, where you can put a one here and a zero here. Okay. In other words, there's a map on z, there's a map on this space which is just chaining the second coordinate by plus one, right? This is a group. You can just add plus one to the second coordinate, and that changes your two ergodic measures and interchanges them. Everybody okay with that? And this is really a very general thing, kind of, when you set up skew products like this, if this is a compact group, the compact group then acts transitively on the set of ergodic measures. Um, assuming you were uniquely ergodic, or it acts transitively on the ergodic measures that project to whatever ergodic measure you have to, to begin with. Everyone okay with this? 
as I said, nothing really is going on yet. OK, so now let's do the next step, which is, you know, there really was nothing all that special about the fact that I did one step here. I could have done 15 steps here. OK, so now I want to pick A2, a measurable set. And then I want to pick M2, a natural number. And I want A2, comma, T of A2, comma, the dot, the dot, T to the M2 of A2, A and T of A in disjoint sets. No. Line. I want these to be disjoint. And I also want that A2 to the N2 of A2, A and T of A to be disjoint sets. OK, is everybody happy about this? So I have two different disjointness conditions. One is I want A2, T of A2, all the way out to T to the N2 of A2 to be disjoint. And the other one is I want just the sets A2 and T to the N2 of A2 to be disjoint from the two I considered beforehand which themselves were disjoint. Everyone okay with that? So now I can define a new map, t hat sub 2, which will map from x cross z mod 2, z2 to itself. Okay. And it's not probably all that surprising as what I have wanted to define it to be t hat sub 2 of x comma i will be equal now to uh, t of x comma i plus now a slightly more complicated characteristic function a union t of a union a2 union t to the m2 of a2 of x. Okay. All right, so here's the giant expression. Uh, basically, I had the same map I had at t hat, but I'm going to now jump between fibers at two additional places. Are you missing a 2 at the last a two? Yes, I'm missing a 2 at the last a. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'm now jumping at two new places in addition at a2 and t to the n2 of a2. So you can inductively think of this as taking my previous map t hat and just adding two new places to jump between the fibers. Is everybody OK with this? Okay. And once again, this has two ergodic measures. Both project to mu. So you assume that your, your base is ergodic when you say this? It has two ergodic measures that project to mu. I'm not saying it has only two ergodic measures. Right. We'll be considering it over minimal rotations, so it will be uniquely ergodic in the case we care about. But both project to mu. They're interchanged by plus one. by plus 1 on the second coordinate. And now let's say one more thing about this. Uh, 1 is supported on and this is a little complicated to write down, so I will go to my notes. minus T of A union X minus T of A ah, union the union from I equals 1 to N sub 2 of T to the I of A2 union A intersect the union from i equals 1 to n2 of t to the i of a2. OK, a here, a here, a2 here, a2 here, cross 0. So this whole set is a subset of the original space I considered x. 
I'm going to describe this set in other words in a minute, but let's just say that this is a whole thing is a subset of x, and I'm putting this at the fiber 0, and then its complement is going to be at the fiber 1. So union um, the complement, so that's going to be T of A minus T of A minus the union from I equals 1 to N2 of T to the I of A2 union uh, T of A the union from I equals 1 to N2 of T to the I of A2 minus T of A. This so let's say let's put in parentheses. Um, and we cross it with one. Alright. So what you do is so okay, you can explicitly figure out the sets where you move from one fiber to another and write it down. Or you could inductively write down what the sets are. Okay? So if I call this set y2, I'm sorry, if I call this set y1, I want to write this set I have here, y2 in terms of y1. Okay? And so what will y2 be? So call this y2. Let's call this y2. And y2 is also equal to, y2 is also equal to uh, y1 um, minus the union from i equals 1 to n2 of t to the i of a2 cross 0 comma 1, now the two-point set, plus, I'm sorry, union y1, I'm sorry, um, y1 plus 1, where plus 1 means plus 1 on the second coordinate, intersect this set. Um, intersect the union from i equals 1 to n2 of t to the i of a2 cross 0, 1. Okay. Let me say in words what this is. In words what this is is you consider, you consider the union t of a2 all the way out to t to the n2 of a2 and on that set you, look, you flip the fibers you were in before. Right? Everything stays the same except on this set. And you flip the fibers you were in at the previous step. Is everybody okay with that? And that's exactly what we did in the first step as well. Except our set wasn't some kind of big union, it was just T of A. It was just A comma T. It was just T of A. And on that one set, you flipped whatever side fiber you were in. So you could think of this first step as actually being the first step of the induction, and the zeroth step of the induction would be the identity map on the second coordinate, where you never change what's in the second coordinate. Is everyone okay with this? Let me talk about why this is. So why is this? I travel around perhaps for a long time looking like I'm T hat. I'm traveling under T hat sub 2, but I haven't seen A sub 2 yet, and I haven't seen T to the N2 of A2 yet. Eventually, I see a sub 2, and I pick up a plus 1. Then I keep traveling as, we, as if I was traveling under t hat, until I see either a2 again, or t to the n2 of a2 again. But I'm going to see t to the n2 of a2 before I see a2 again, by my disjointness assumption. Okay? So on this tower, that plus 1, oh, so on this set, that plus 1 is going to survive until I land here and then it's going to be switched. So when I pick up that plus 1, I think I'm living in y1 plus 1. I don't think I'm living in y1 anymore. Okay? And that's exactly what's going on. Okay, who's with me now? Okay, not many people, so let's talk through the whole construction again, because it's um, quite painfully written out.
idea. So the idea is I have some map T hat that I've already defined. So hat T hat. So I've got some kind of space with two fibers here. Okay? The, these two fibers should be the same. <coughs> okay, these are the same. This is x comma zero and this is maybe x comma one. Oh yeah. So we need to split x comma uh, plus zero. And then what I do is I introduce two new sets. This is going to be A2. And over here maybe it will be a T to the N2 of A2. And similarly, this is here and here. So unless I'm in one of these two circles, I look exactly what like T hat. But when I'm in these two circles, in my next step, I flip whatever I would have done under T hat. Is everybody okay with that so far? Okay? So I traveled alone for a long time before I hit the first circle. Then I hit the first circle and I go to the wrong place. I go to the opposite place as where I was before. And I kind of drew this wrong. I'd be dancing around according to T hat anyways. But then when I land here, I flip whatever I had done before. Okay? The next step, so long as n2 isn't equal to 1, so long as n2 isn't equal to 1, the next step will be the exact same as what t hat would have done to the image point, which is plus 1 to what t hat would have done to my starting point. Is everybody okay with that? I've picked up this plus 1. And that's going to continue until I see the difference in the skew product again, which will, the difference in the skew product is just a2 and t to the n2 of a2. Now, because these are all disjoint sets, I'm going to travel disjointly through these sets until I land here. I'm not going to see A2 again. I'm going to see T to the N2 of A2 first. Is everybody okay with that? And then I will have picked up another plus one, but I'm acting modulo two. Once I've gotten two plus ones, I'm back to how I started. So everything is flipped on the, or on the set. A2, T, I'm sorry, T of A2, T squared of A2, so forth, all the way up to T to the N2 of A2. And on everything else, it stays the same as it was before. Oh, now who's with me? Okay, thank you guys very much for asking that question. <laughs> this is a complicated thing, but it's pretty simple once you get it. Okay? Um, okay, so that's... This picture, and then of course, why stop at two? And everyone can answer, there's no good reason to stop at two, where two is a two, right? Two is not z mod two z. Two is a two. So inductively, uh, choose uh, a n plus one. Uh, n is a bad choice, a k plus 1 and n k plus 1, where this is a measurable set and this is a natural number, so that uh, a k plus 1, t of a k plus 1, all the way out to t to the n k plus 1 of a k plus 1 are disjoint. And then um, I also want that the sets a comma a two comma da 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 comma a k plus one comma t of a t to the n two of a two comma da 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 t to the n k plus one of a k plus one. I want these to be disjoint. So this is the mirror of the two disjointness conditions I have here. Will you put this? And then it should be no surprise what I'm going to define t hat sub k plus one to be. It's going to send x comma i to be 
Well, t of x in the first coordinate, and then i plus a characteristic function. What's it going to be in the characteristic function is? It's going to be the union from j equals 1 to k plus 1 of a k, where a1 will be equal to a. Uh, aj. AJ. Thank you. Aj. Uh, union, the union from j equals 1 to k plus 1 of t to the nj of aj. Um, and just as an aside, a1 is defined to be equal to a, and n1 is defined to be equal to 1. So is that important? You... No, no. The first step you could have chosen instead of a and t of a, you could have chosen a and t to the 15th of a, so long as a, t of a, dot, 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 t to the 15th of a were all disjoint sets. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Or alternately, you could choose the first a to be the empty set in that. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, but that's worthwhile to mention. OK. Um, and I've got a schematic picture for what's going on here. So there's a schematic picture of the first step of the induction, the passage from A to um, from T hat to T2. So these are going, you can think of these as being the sets um, A2, these being the sets A2, T of A2, all the way, way up to T to the N2 of A2. Right? And you stay in the same one at A2, and otherwise you flip between the two. That's the schematic picture. Build, do this in the special case of rotations. And I'm very happy that Omri defined continued fraction expansions because this is connected to continued fraction expansions. And so what's the point? The point, to steal the thunder of where I'm going, the point is that when you consider rotation of the circle, so long as you're not considering uh, a rotation by an irrational number that's bounded partial quotients, and you're rotating by an irrational number, you can run this construction, and you can arrange for the union of all of these AIs to be an interval. Okay? People okay with this? Okay. All right, so let's do a brief recollection of continued fractions. Okay, so if alpha, so recall from, I don't know, 20 minutes ago, if alpha is in 0 comma 1 minus q, there exists unique um, a1 comma da 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 da, a k comma da 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 da, so that, oh, these are all in the natural numbers. So that alpha is equal to 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2 plus 1 over a3 plus that. Now I need a little bit more notation than Omri did. So I can also consider the let p and with alpha understood. So going back to Leor's very first question at the start of my talk, I want to talk about a family of objects. But we think of each element of the family individually. So you can build constructions like this for a different alpha, but let alpha be understood for now, an and we'll talk about this for this given alpha. Okay? So with alpha understood, Pn over Qn is equal to 1 over A1 plus 1 over A2 plus 1 over A3 plus da 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 plus 1 over a n. Okay, so this is some rational number, and that's pn over qn. Okay? Now, it turns out that pn over qn is extremely close to alpha. So fact, which is actually not that difficult to prove, um, for example, but you can find it, for example, in Hinchin's book on continued fractions, is that alpha divided by pn over qn is proportional 
by constants that are independent of the n and independent of the alpha to 1 over qn squared. If this is a lie, you need to also consider a n plus 1. Everyone happy with this? Okay. So this is just a fact. Take this as a black box. And this has a consequence for rotations. And what is the consequence of rotations? So if R mapping the 0, 1 interval to itself is rotation by alpha, And that's formula just for those who want to please remember is that r of x is equal to x plus alpha minus the integer part of x plus alpha. So this is just x plus alpha modulo 1. Then what we have is we have that r to the qn of x minus x is comparable by uniform constant to 1 over qn times a n, 1 over a n plus 1. So this is the level of approximation of closeness you get to x. Um, maybe I should put a distance here. Where this is distance thought of and the 0, 1 circle. So 0 and 1 are identified. And so that's this idea of distance. Is everybody OK with that? Okay. Now there's another fact that's not so hard to see. Let me copy it from my notes. If n is odd. Pn over Qn, this one's very easy to prove. Pn over Qn is less than alpha, and if n is even, no, I have it the wrong way, I think. Pn, let's see, if n is odd, Pn over Qn is greater than alpha. And if n is even, it's less than alpha. And I think I have this right, but up to switching the words even and odd, this is correct. And this has the consequence of rotations that it goes the opposite direction. So if n is odd, r to the qn of x is close and to the, so greater than alpha would be to the right, so this should be to the left, is close and to the left. And similarly, that R and Q of N of X, um, if it's even, it's going to be to the right of X. Is everybody okay with this? So these are just some facts. It's a nice little setup we have going here. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to take advantage of the fact that I'm not even going to write down that rotations are isometry. So if I have a little interval and I look at how it's shifted by the rotation, the entire little interval with it is shifted. So in particular, if I have an interval of length, um, the distance between x and r to the qn of x, and I apply r to the qn of that, it's going to move right adjacent to itself. Is everyone OK with that? This is the most important part of the construction, is this very simple observation, that if you have an interval, so a simple Disaster for people who know how these chords work. Okay. Okay. Um, so if uh, so, r to the qn of an interval of i, an interval of length. distance from x to r to the qn of x. 
is adjacent. I. Okay, is everybody happy with it? Because we've got one point that's x and one point that's r to the qn of x. Depending on parity, one is on the left and one is on the right, or the other way around, depending on the parity of n. And then so x will move to r to the qn of x, so let's assume that x was the left endpoint and r to the qn of x was the right endpoint, which would be the case when n is even. Then I apply r to the qn to this interval, so its left endpoint goes to where its right endpoint was, and the whole interval travels around with it. Is everybody okay with this? Somehow a trivial observation. Um, okay. So now what I want to do is I want to consider the basis for this construction. So uh, earlier you mentioned something that something happens only when the uh, the AIs are unbounded. Yeah, the construction, uh, we're going to get there in a bit. We need, uh, so, okay, so th this is actually good. Thanks for the question. So you'll be able to construct a minimal, not uniquely ergodic, z mod 2z skew product over rotation, where you skew over a single interval, if and only if the bounded, um, if and only if uh, your unbounded partial quotients. You can do it over two intervals anytime you're irrational, and I showed that. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Um, okay, so now what I want to do is I want to let A, so let's skip A1. So let A2 uh, be an interval of length um, R, uh, the distance, from R to the Q N sub K of X to X. I'm just putting an X down here. It doesn't matter which X you choose because rotations are isometries. This These is, are all the same. This is A2 or AK? Q. It's no, no, Q. The, the interval is A2? This is A2. It's an interval of length this. Okay. Okay. All right. And let uh, O N, you, you have a very good point. This is a bad choice of variables. Thank you for that. So let's call this J sub K. Can you increase font size? Yes. For exponents? Yes. <laughs> Q. <laughs> Distance of R to the Q sub J sub K of X. X. Hopefully this is readable. Okay. Q sub J sub X of X. And then M2, uh, let M2 be equal to Q sub J sub K. Okay? So now the intervals that I want to skew over, I want to skew over A2 union T to the M2 of A2. And that's going to be two adjacent intervals. So A2 union T, let's say R to the Q M2 of A2. Once again, this is... Q of two J two. Uh, yeah, this will be N K. Sorry, N K. A uh, I I'm sorry. I'm messing everything up. I got too general too quick. Sorry about this. It will be an interval. Length um, two times the distance from R to the Q sub J sub K of X to X. I mean, so it's going to be a nice interval. Okay. And inductively, everything happens wonderfully because we're doing it, we're acting by an isometry. You might as well just choose your next interval to begin where the last interval ended. Why not? Okay. So. In general, we can define our map r hat sub k to map x comma i to be equal to uh, x, uh, sorry, r of x, say i plus maybe the interval from 
0, comma, the summation in j equals 1, uh, j is already claimed, l equals 1 to k. I'm sorry. Yeah, the summation from l equals 1 to k of 2 times the distance from r to the q j sub l of x comma x. What was this? Uh, let's call this zero. Why not zero? Zero. And this will be... Uh, no, 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 I did this. x comma x. It doesn't matter what this is. Okay, so zero comma zero. So we apply this to x. Sorry about that, everybody. Okay, so this is the formula. You're just summing twice the distances because you've arranged these intervals to be adjacent to each other. Okay? Um, and this is the transformation. Um, okay, and this is a transformation as we had before, except for the disjointness condition. Everything is fine except for disjointness. except for the passable disjointness conditions, and these can be fixed by the following simple conditions. You can ask that the uh, J, L all have same parity. And you, can, you also want to request that A sub J sub L plus 1. So the plus 1 is being added to J sub L, not to L. Okay, just for parsing, let's say it's greater than or equal to 5 for all L. Okay. And this it covers the disjointness conditions. Okay. So this whole construction starts with a subsequent QJK? Yep. That's the input? And for any, for any, for any such subsequent? Well, uh, you get a map. Right? This is going to give you a well-defined map, or at least well-defined almost everywhere in the limit. Okay, so continuing this uh, to infinity, we get r infinity, uh, r hat sub infinity, mapping uh, 0 comma 1 cross z ma 2z a well-defined map. Indeed, the, these distances are decreasing exponentially fast. And the sums to a number less than 1, this is going to be a well-defined transformation of the 0, 1 interval. This function is well-defined on the 0, 1 interval in the limit. Is everyone okay with that? Um, and so this is a per perfectly good map now. And we can ask, is this ergodic? Is this uniquely ergodic or not? Okay. Is it clear that it's minimal? Uh, is it clear that it's minimal? So long as you've arranged it so that this point doesn't land in an orbit of zero, then it's going to be minimal. So I think it's, in, um, under general assumptions, it's minimal. Um, is this uniquely ergodic or not? And the answer is um, uniquely ergodic if and only if the summation of 1 over a sub j sub l from l equals 1 to infinity is less than infinity. Okay? And I just want to describe one of the directions. I'm sorry, if it diverges. That's uniquely ergodic. So it's not uniquely ergodic if and only if this converges. And what I want to explain to you guys is the fact that if this converges, then you are, you have two ergodic measures. So if the summation of the one over a subject, oh, I left out a plus one. Sorry, there's a plus one here. If the summation of a sub j sub l 
plus one is less than infinity to ergodic measures. <clears throat> okay? And so what's the reason why? The reason why is that the summation of the Lebesgue measures of the successive differences of y sub j plus one minus y sub j, where these are defined just as I did above. Right, we have these maps R hat sub k, they follow our construction above, they have uh, two different ergodic measures with well-defined supports that can be defined inductively, right? And I call those supports y sub j and y sub j plus one. If, it only, if this converges, then I'm not uniquely ergodic. Indeed, my ergodic measures will be the characteristic with the weak star limits of Lebesgue times the characteristic function of the y sub j's as j goes to infinity. And this summation condition is going to tell you that measure weak star converges to a measure other than Lebesgue. Indeed, almost every point will either eventually be in its complement or be in the set for all larger times. Is everybody okay with that? Was yes. Y sub j exactly the, it's, the index of the characteristic function? Of, um, so I had these sets that I defined before. I hope they're still on the, they're not still on the board, unfortunately. But in this construction, I called my set the first set y sub one, and then I called the next set y sub two, uh, and these were the supports of the ergodic measures of these sets oh, yeah. t hat and t hat sub two. Thank you for this question. And in general, you build y sub j plus 1 from y sub j by taking the union of a sub j plus 1, uh, t of a sub j plus 1, all the way out to t to the n sub j of a sub j plus 1, and you flip the measure on that set. Thank you for that question. Did that make sense to everybody with these y sub j's? So y sub j is, is the support of one ergodic measure? Correct. And if I plus it with 1? You get the other one. The other ones. Yeah. Okay. And if the support converges, then you're not uniquely ergodic. And indeed, your measure is going to be supported on the weak star limit of Lebesgue times the characteristic function of the y sub j plus ones. Right? This convergence condition is going to tell you points will eventually always be in it or always at the outside up to null sets. Is everyone okay with this? So that's, yeah. So are you losing your mentality then? The, the minimality is kind of easy to show by the team condition. The, the minimality is true under big generality, but let's ignore that. Okay. Okay. Um, in particular, because these are, orbits are getting longer and longer, you're switching under denser and denser sets. Okay. The sets on which you're flipping between these are denser and denser. So your y sub j's are getting denser and denser in the space. But let's not worry about that for interests of time. Okay. All right, so this is not uniquely ergodic. Um, okay, and now, so what is the measure? So what is uh, the Lebesgue measure of y sub j plus 1 minus y sub j? So this is going to have measure proportional to, it's going to be proportional to um, q sub, oh, j is a bad choice. Um, yeah, so let's go with q sub k sub j times um, the Lebesgue measure of a sub j. I'm sorry, plus one, plus one. Right, we flip what it is on this orbit segment of length m sub j plus one of the set we considered. Is everybody okay with that? And my m sub j plus ones were these q were these best convergence. And now this is going to be proportional from the fact we have right here. It's going to be proportional to 1 over a sub k sub j plus 1 plus 1. I'm sorry, the plus 1 is here. OK, so we're in the superscript. Then we have k sub j plus 1 here. And then we add 1 to k sub j plus 1. So this is in the subscript of the A, but not in the subscript of the K. Are people okay with that? 
Unfortunately, these things, we're doing inductive constructions, and it depends on the next term in the continued fraction expansion. So this is the world we're living in. OK, so that's what this is proportional to. And so the convergence of this is, is governed by the convergence of this object. For the other direction, you need to use kind of the independence of these, the eventual independence of these sets from each other, these differences, and that goes beyond the scope of today's talk, which I don't think I'll have time to cover everything I wanted to anyways. Okay, so let's briefly recall how this construction is built. It's an iterative construction where you pick an interval and look at an image of it that moves adjacently to itself. Okay, if you cook this up right, the unions that, are that you move before you move adjacently to itself have very, very little measure, right? They have as small measure as you want, depending on how big you choose this number to be, okay? And you can choose this to be as big as you want if and only if your alpha has, bound has unbounded partial quotients, okay? And then these, you can kind of keep iterating and repeating this construction over and over again and you can see that you get ergodic measures where you're, you're, you're getting a sequence of ergodic measures where you're changing them on sets of smaller and smaller measure. And so in the limit, you'll get some interesting F sigma set of measure, one half in the, of the total space, which will be actually on the nose invariant from your limiting transformation. And that's the idea of this construction. Okay. It, it, who's with me now? Almost nobody. Okay, let's. Um, okay, so I think I won't get to the geometry. So I'll just take the remainder of the time. Do I have an extra five minutes because I started a little later? Okay, thanks. Um, so I just want to talk through this idea. So let's go through the steps again. Um, maybe we can work. Uh, yeah, so let's go through the steps again. So I want to build a limiting construction. And so I want to tell you the pre-limit objects. And the pre-limit objects will be these r hat of x comma i's. Okay? Right? And they'll be intervals defined in this way. Okay? And modulo some technical details, you can assume that we're in the situation we had talked about when everything was abstract and sort of nothing was going on. Okay? Are people with me on that fact? Okay, great, I'm getting more nods. This makes me happy. And what we want to do is we want to, in the limit, get a transformation and study that, uh, the properties of that limiting transformation by studying the pre-limited objects. Okay? Seems like a natural thing to do also, right? Okay. So what I want to do is I want to claim that an invariant set for the limiting transformation can be thought of as a limit of the invariant sets of the pre-limiting transformations, uh, assuming that the correct limits exist. Okay? So in particular, if I have an on-the-nose invariant set for the pre-limiting transformations, I can take the set limb inf of these. So I want to look at the set of all x's, so that x is in uh, y sub j for all large enough j. Okay, I want to look at this set, and this will be invariant for the limiting transformation. Okay, it might be a zero set, and in fact it will be a zero set if this set, if this family diverges, if and only if this diverges, but if this is not a zero set, it turns out that it actually has to have half the measure of the entire space, and this will be the support of an invariant measure that's absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure on the space. Who's with me now? Okay, I've lost probably 80% of the people Can I had before. Can you define to... YG? What? Can you define YG? Yeah, okay, so what's YG going to be? It's going to be the support, one of the supports. Yeah, so YJ is one of the supports. Um, the ergodic measures of R hat subject. 
Right? So keep in mind, we're repeating the construction we did before. We're going to have two ergodic measures for r hat sub j, both of which project to being the big on the 0, 1 interval, and both are interchanged by plus 1 and the second coordinate. We call one of these sets y sub j, and inductively y sub j plus 1 is obtained from y sub j by taking the union of t of a sub j plus 1, t squared of a sub j plus 1, all the way out to t sub m sub j plus 1 of a sub j plus 1, and flipping between them on those two coordinates. So it's just that interval uh, on the top of the board, uh, on one circle and the complement on the other circle? No. So if I, if I was doing the k plus 1 step from the case, I'd be adding on another piece of 2d of q sub j sub k plus 1 of 0 comma 0. You take the first one of those two pieces, and you take the union of the q sub j sub k plus 1 uh, iterates of it, which are all disjoint, and that's the set you flip on. And this is where minimality comes from. It comes because this set's getting denser and denser. Did that answer your question? Yeah, and, and one question before you say the limiting construction. So what is, uh, what is the property that limiting construction has, but, the, uh, but this R key doesn't? Oh, it's going to be minimal. Minimal, okay. Yeah. yeah. OK. All right. So now, so this is what our y sub j's are. This is going to be the lim inf of the y sub j's, the set lim inf of the y sub j's. And the claim is that it has measure 1 half if and only if this sum converges. Okay? And I really only care about one direction, which is that it has measure 1 half if this sum converges. Okay? Now, because my two met ergodic measures are exchanged by plus 1, if it has positive measure, it has to have measure 1 half. Okay? Okay? And the set limit, each of these y sub j's individually has measure 1 half. So the set limit inf is going to be positive if this converges. Right? Because the total points you'll lose will be just the sum of the tail. Right? And that can be as small as you want. Okay? And so our ergodic set, the, the, there's going to be a carrying set for our ergodic measure, which is very concrete of f sigma set. It's a very concrete f sigma set. It's going to be this. That's what it is. But you said that the sequence of characteristic functions you think of them as uh, some of the differences increments, then it converges absolutely, and so yeah. it's converging yeah. in L1. So. Yeah. There's a lot of ways to see this. Okay. All right. Who's with me now in this construction? OK, I've, I think quadrupled the number I had before, which is maybe one-tenth of the people who are here. Um, so maybe I also think I have run out of time. So uh, thanks for your time. Questions? Comments? So you're going to join the <coughs> construction next time? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'll be available from 4.30 to 5.30 during the free construction uh, free uh, time if people want to ask any, any questions on this construction. <laughs> If there are no questions, thanks again.